Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan, Roth the Motor City, Mad Mouth. Alongside of me tonight is my regular Thursday tandem of Xavier McKnight. How you doing, Xavier? Doing well, Scott. Great to be on with you. Glad to have you. And Malfar Jr., what's going on, big guy? Not much, man. How are you guys doing? All right. Well, for uh, those individuals that are new to the program, I want both of you guys to give a basic introduction here about uh, yourself, and then we'll get to the uh, meat and the potatoes. All right? Go ahead, Xavier. Lead it off. All right. Well, I currently reside in Bradenton, Florida, and I work in Sarasota, Florida, where I work in the newsroom currently as a digital content producer and anything else that they need me to do at the station. But um, I'm also on here on the WSAN network every other Friday. Tomorrow will be one of those Fridays with my own show with Scott titled The Real and the Rare. We dish out some hot, spicy, sizzling entrees in our kitchen on those nights. So we hope that you guys will tune into that content as well. And you can also catch me more here on the Sports Exchange and other programming that we have here on the WSAN network. All right, Mel, you're up. Yeah, well, hi. I live here in Atlanta, Georgia currently. Um, I'm in, you know, I'm in, in business for myself, also in the financial services industry. I joined Scott on this weekly program and, and Xavier, and I'm privileged to be here and glad to be here and glad to be a part of it and look forward to a great show. All right, Mel, why don't you, I want you to let everybody know who you played for when you were playing football, besides UCLA football, uh, right? A long, a long time ago in another life, I played with the, with the Los Angeles Rams back when they were originally in Los Angeles. So it was back in 1989. Yeah, another lifetime ago. <laughs> you know what? It's funny how you say that. I was on a NSMA called National Sports Media Association. We're talking hockey today, and I'm bringing up some names of the past, and I was telling the panelists another lifetime ago, that thing called a transistor radio. Xavier McKnight, I wonder if you even know what a transistor radio ever was. I do not. Good. I figured. <laughs> I rest my case. Mel does, right? Of course. He probably doesn't know what a Walkman what the Walkman is either. <laughs> exactly. No, no, I know what a Walkman is. I actually had a Walkman when I was eight years old. Really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we got him on the. Tra- I'm impressed. Well, we got him on the transistor radio at least, Mel. So one out of two is not bad, right? Absolutely. I mean, he doesn't remember when cars, when uh, FM was an option, FM radio was an option, air conditioning was an option. He, he doesn't remember those days. I remember my days early in the car business. All those things were an option. I know. Cruise control was, don't forget that one either, Mel. Cruise control was an option. Absolutely. Remember that? See, Xavier? Power, power, windows, and, power windows and power door locks, all that stuff was an option. Ask Xavier McKnight to uh, Google up what a Ford LTD was or an AMC Gremlin. Yeah, those, those are beauties. Yeah, uh, Xavier McKnight, we don't want to make you feel young, but once upon a time, as they say in the storytelling business. Oh, well, but we won't say that anything once upon a time when it comes to talking football. We're going to lead off with a little college football, though, first, okay? One thing that came to mind the other day is that 10 UCF players have opted out of the 2020 season. Now, I know that there's been a lot of calming talk about college football, but let's address the UCF Knights and 20 guys deciding not to play uh, ball this year. Who wants to take the lead on this? Go ahead, Mel. You uh, you start us off. Well, um, this is the first I'm hearing of, of that. So, um, and, you know, there's a lot of guys, uh, and I was looking at, um, at ESPN.com yesterday, and there's a lot of guys, uh, the, the kid from the University of Georgia, I know this is not what we're talking about with them, Got a transfer, a quarterback transfer from Wake Forest, University of Georgia, is opting out, and is just going to forego his, his this season and get ready for the NFL draft. Now, you're and if t- that's what guys are doing, I think that's a mistake. You're in t- my t- opinion, I, I I don't think you need that year away from football, and particularly at the quarterback position. Well, you're talking about Jamie Newman, right? Mel, you're talking about Jamie Newman, right, the Georgia quarterback. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Go ahead. Continue. Sorry. So, I, I don't. I don't know the circumstances surrounding the kids at, U, at UCF because I didn't see. I didn't see it. Right. Um, but if they're doing it because of the coronavirus, I understand. And, and because you know any type of health conditions that they may have, or someone close to them may have, or maybe they're not comfortable with the protocols that are in place. Right. You know, it, you know it's everybody's individual decision. I understand, it, but if they're doing it 
and getting ready for the, to, to get themselves ready for the draft, I think that's a mistake. No, I, I don't think you're going to have 20 players getting ready for the draft. My gut feeling, Mel, is that with the UCF football team, 20 of them are probably concerned about their medical. So I, I, that's what I would suggest. But Xavier, what do you think? Well, as Mel just said, if this is in regards to COVID-19, kudos to those players for being responsible and making a decision that can't be easy for them whatsoever. We're more so related to football and getting ready for the NFL. I also do believe that it's a mistake. I believe you do need to get that year in of football and not being away from the gridiron for so long, being used to taking hits, being used to taking reps and all of those things that it takes to get ready for gameplay. But we're only hearing, according to reports, that two of those 10 players that opted out are starters. The okay. other eight players are players who are second or third string players on the team. So only two of those players potentially would possibly be taking this time to get ready for the NFL draft right now anyway. But even if that is the case, it's not necessarily the smartest move. But if this is related to the pandemic, kudos to those players for being responsible and making a decision that can't be very easy. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, no, nobody's going to debate the medical. I mean, if two of them are starters and the other eight, well, then so be it. Not like you don't have enough players on a college football team anyhow that you can't replace 10 guys, right, Mel? Our college teams usually have like, what, 90 to 100 uh, guys a roster, give or take, depending on the scholarship count, would you say? Yes, that's true. Right, so they no shortage. They guys on scholarship and they can have about 100. This year they upped the amount of players that they can actually keep on the team. I forgot what it was, 105 or something like that, right. 110. Well, yeah, well, so they, it's not like you can't replace those 10 guys without a doubt. So, you know, but yeah, I mean, again, everything in a very unprecedented year, uh, obviously circles around COVID-19. So, but you know, I thought we'd lead it off here with UCLF and uh, another TBD. Well, I'll be curious to see how many other, um, larger amount of players, uh, opt out as time goes on. We still have another couple weeks to go on this. So. You know, this is a developing story that we're going to continue to follow every Thursday. That's what we have on the UCF side. Anything, y'all, that you two want to add to it? What'd you say? No, just simply we'll just have to wait to see what's going to happen with UCF football and all of football in college that's scheduled to have games this season. We'll see if this continues to be a pattern or not. Okay, fair enough. All right, well, according to Miami Dolphins head coach Brian Flores, to his hip injury is a factor in uh, the team's early six season as uh, QB plans. Now, the latest report was that Josh Rosen, uh, apparently the uh, Dolphins are fielding trade inquiries. So let's talk about Tua first, and then we'll talk about Josh Rosen second. Who, do you, who wants to take uh, the lead on this? I'll take the lead on this one just simply because it makes the most sense for me that Tua is the number two quarterback because at some point during the season, I believe he's actually going to start some games. Maybe it's a Patrick Mahomes-like situation where we only see him towards the tail end of the year as he continues to rehab while also taking reps in practice and getting used to taking hits in the uh, NFL from NFL players, even though he won't be taking them from teams, from players on opposing teams, I should say. But it might be a Patrick Mahomes-level situation where Ryan Tannehill is in that first spot for most of the season. But depending on where the Dolphins are in the season, if we get to week nine and this team is two and seven or three and five, they may decide, okay, it's time to give the kid the keys to the offense. But I believe they have him slated in the right spot. I'm not surprised to hear that Josh Rosen is on the trade radar. We, uh, once again, we heard about these trade rumors with Josh Rosen again with the NFL draft looming and hearing that the Miami Dolphins were either going to draft to a tongue of Iloa or Justin Herbert, one or the other. They were going to get a franchise quarterback in the draft. Josh Rosen gave them a sample size last season, and it wasn't as impressive as many were hoping that it was going to come out to be. So I'm not surprised to hear his names on the trade radar again. At this point, I don't know what team he could possibly go to and really have a chance of really making an impact. That remains to be seen. He's on the trade radar, but I actually believe he will go into the season on the Miami Dolphins roster just simply because I don't see teams in a major need for a quarterback right now. Maybe the Cincinnati Bengals take a chance on this and try to get a backup in place for Joe Burrow, who we learned a few days ago will be the starter for that team. 
as head coach Zach Taylor announced just a few days ago. But other than that, I don't see a situation where Josh Rosen can actually go and thrive right now and have a legitimate shot of competing for a starting quarterback position. But before we go any further, speaking of Brian Fitzpatrick, I would like to take the time to offer my heartfelt thoughts, prayers, and condolences to him and his family. He lost his mother on last week, and he found out while he was in practice with the Miami Dolphins. And he left practice, and he was reportedly very distraught. And head coach Brian Flores has come out and said that they are giving him as much time away as he needs as he grieves with this horrible loss. Well, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, Ryan Fitzpatrick has always been a bridge quarterback for sure, and Brian Flores is turning out to be a really classy coach. And I've heard uh, through uh, Steve Ballesteri, who I had on the Sports Exchange earlier, that Brian Flores has an unbelievable personality. He's not anywhere like Matt Patricia. He's his own. And let's face the reality, you know, uh, family first. I mean, and uh, the Dolphins are handling this thing really well. So, Mel, what's your take on it? I, I have a feeling you're right, though, Xavier. The Cincinnati Bengals could be a good landing spot. And I think the Dolphins are gauging the interest. But I think, I don't know, of all the teams that are out there, Xavier, for some crazy reason, I think the Cincinnati Reds makes a whole lot of sense. All right, Mel, what's your take on this? I, um... I think the best thing for Tua is for him <clears throat> to sit this year entirely if he can, um, to give his hip an opportunity to heal completely. Uh, I know I was listening to Brandon Marshall and he was talking about the, he had three hip surgeries and, and the difficulty coming back from the hip surgery. Um, and I, and I was just last week, a kid that played with my, with my nephew in high school in Georgia, <clears throat> um, uh, Dominic Blaylock. Blaylock he just tore his ACL again and he had tore it in the championship game in the, uh, I believe he tore it in the, in the, um, SEC championship game. Right. And, uh, he just tore it again in practice for the second time. So he's going to be out. And I think, you know, trying to rush these guys back too soon, you know, I, I think that would, that would do irreparable harm to the franchise by trying to rush two out there too soon. They have a, a capable quality starter. In, uh, in Ryan Fitz- Fitzpatrick, he's been around a long time. And even if you want to keep Josh Rosen around, to let him go in there and try to build his trade value, if you want to, if you want to get rid of him, I know they, you know, they've been t- taking on feelers. I don't know if they've been taking feelers. I mean, I, I don't know if they've been fielding trade talks. I think they've just been putting out feelers to see what they can get for him. Right. Uh, they gave up a second round pick and a fifth round pick for him. Uh, I know they would like to try to get something comparable to that. They probably won't. But they would like to get something for him. You know, Leonard Fournette just got released. Supposedly Jacksonville couldn't get anything for him. And I think there comes a time where people realize that eventually this player is going to get released. And I think that's the same way people feel about Josh Rosen. We don't have to give up anything. He'll ultimately get released and we'll be able to get him and we won't have to give up anything. So most teams are going to shy away from that. Everybody right now is looking at their rosters. They're trying to finalize their rosters with the players that they have in camp right now. And they're probably pretty satisfied with the players that they have in camp right now. Yeah, I was never high on Josh Rosen coming out of, even though he's a UCLA guy, I was never high on him coming out of college. Uh, I think he's humbled, been humbled a little bit, obviously, by his experiences in Arizona and, and there in Miami. Uh, maybe he can be a serviceable backup quarterback. I really, I really don't know. I don't see starting quarterback on future, unfortunately, in his future, when you look at the league right now, realizing that every year they're drafting players constantly. So I don't really see it. You know, maybe he can, you know, land somewhere and, and, and be the number two quarterback and, and maybe get an opportunity to step in there for a game or two and just kind of keep, keep things going. But I, I, you know, as far as two is concerned, I think the best thing that they can do for him, because remember, he just got hurt. I think he hurt his hip in November. I want to say it was either October or November. Right. He hurt his hip. You know, we're only about 10 months from, 10 months from that injury. You know, that's a serious injury that he had. I think the best thing they could do is try to, you know, keep, keep him out this year. Don't, don't have him play it a down this year and come back next year and, and right. go at it. Yeah, there's certain injuries that you go ahead and you could probably bring back, but I wouldn't mess with a hip surgery. By the way, I have a question for you, Mel. We're not doing this with Zoom, but somehow, some way, you must be reading my mind about what we're going to be talking uh, best. My goodness, you talk about Melt Bar, Mr. Broadcaster Segway. 
you couldn't have segued any more than where we're going now. And that is the fact that the Jaguars not only released Leonard Fournette this week, but he landed with the Tampa Bay Bucks. And Doug Marone said that he couldn't get anything for him because guess what? Everybody knew they were going to get rid of him. So you might as well get him for nothing. All right, Mel, since you started it, you continue with this thing. I'm handing the ball off to you on Fournette, the Jags, and the Bucks. Go ahead, Mel. I was talking to a buddy yesterday. We we're, we're thinking about some possible landing spots, and Tampa Bay was one of the places that we thought was very intriguing. Right. Also thought about uh, thought about you know New England maybe because you know they they they're missing that big back that they had when Legarrette Blount was there. Right. And they kind of need that kind of a, that back. Um. And I, but I thought that Tennessee would be an interesting landing point, even though you know I know they're they're high on the guy they have there, Ronald Jones, I think is his name, and then they brought in Shady McCoy as well. But I thought with Bruce Arians, I thought that that would be somebody who would probably, you know, obviously Leonard Fournette is a great talent. Otherwise, he would have been picked number four in the draft. Um, but obviously, there's some other issues that Jacksonville got tired of dealing with. And I was reading the reason why, you know, Jacksonville read on the what the coach said, and I said, this is just a bunch of malarkey. I mean, there's no way you can tell me that there's players that are better than Leonard Fournette and can do what Leonard Fournette can do. And the guy caught 76 passes last year and rushed for 1,100 yards, I want to say. And now you're telling me he's not good enough? That, that I mean, some things you just have to look at and you just, like, you just have to call BS on. And I call BS on that. So Tampa Bay is obviously, you know, they're pushing all their chips in the middle. They right. got Tom Brady. They got Gronkowski. They're, they're all in. So they, they brought in Fournette. And I look forward to seeing what this offense is going to look like with these with the new additions that they brought in. Yeah, I actually covered the Jaguars last year. And think about it for a moment, okay? David Caldwell, the general manager, and Doug Marone are on the hot seat, okay? I don't believe in tanking for Trevor Lawrence. I don't buy it, you know, although who knows, they may land the guy. But there's a dysfunctional situation up in that front office. And I don't think that you go out there – and cut a guy with that much talent. So they must have knew something uh, that we didn't know, or they must have let's uh, cut bait with the guy is what they probably all end up doing uh, because of front office uh, friction. So, Xavier, uh, you know, I, I don't – but I don't, you never know. I mean, this is a make-or-break year for Mar- Marone and Dave Caldwell, and judging by the signals I'm getting up there, it's looking more of a break situation. All right, Xavier, you uh, go ahead and take it from here. Well, Scott, it's almost like you read my mind on where I wanted to go with this conversation next because you're very well connected to that team and the coverage that you provide for them. And all I've been thinking all week, not only with the Leonard Fournette cut, but also with the trade of Yannick Ngakwe and all right. these other moves with other great players on that team that the Jaguars have made, Doug Marone's more than likely going to get fired at the end of this season. Dave Caldwell is more than likely going to get fired at the end of this season. Tank for Sunshine, as they've been calling it on social media. For those who don't know, Sunshine is the nickname that many have for Trevor Lawrence. It is in full effect. And my question is, why didn't you fire these guys at the end of last season if you knew that there was a chance that you were going to come into this season with this type of mindset and just the type of team that you wanted to build just for this year? Not one that was going to be very competitive at all. Because these guys are going to get fired more than likely at the end of this year. And they don't necessarily have the team to really go out there on the field and compete with some of these other teams right now. I mean, this is atrocious what they have done to this roster in the past few months. Just absolutely, they are absolutely unrecognizable from that 2017 team that went all the way to the AFC Championship had a lead in the fourth quarter until Tom Brady and the Patriots did what Tom Brady and the Patriots did many times throughout his tenure in New England that led to them going to nine Super Bowls and winning six of them. But as far as Leonard Fournette going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, hey, all I got to say to that is the rich get richer. Ronald Jones is still expected to be the starting running back there. We're also hearing that LaShawn McCoy is going to continue to have a huge role in that backfield. But no doubt about it, uh, Tom Brady and Bruce Arians, they're going to insert Leonard Fournette in there, and he's going to be a big piece to what they're doing in Tampa Bay. And the Bucks are going all in with what they have for at least two years with Tom Brady, and they want to get to that Super Bowl. Brady wants to get that seventh ring, and the Bucks are doing everything possible to make sure that they are the first team in NFL history 
to have their city host the Super Bowl and for them to play in it. Well, it's funny. I saw Fournette play last year, and I love watching the guy. I think he's a heck of a running back. Old school, right between the tackles, and actually learn how to catch and be a receiver. So he's a power back where, you know, we don't see a lot of those guys as much. And I think Leonard Fournette's a heck of a running back. Whatever problem they have with him, so be it. But the Bucks, like you say, got richer. And, yes, there have been a lot of great players that have left, and now the Jack Wires are exactly where I think they need to be for all the wrong reasons. So I think the word dysfunction, to me, summarizes that situation five hours up I-95 north from southern Florida, without a doubt. So anything else you two want to add to it? I mean, a couple of minutes away, removed from a Super Bowl, and now they're going from peak to pits pretty quick. Well, let me ask Mel this question. Sure. Put yourself and Trevor Lawrence for either the Just or Justin Fields in this particular situation, but more than likely Trevor Lawrence. If you see what's going on in Jacksonville and you know that you are the draft target that they're going after, do you even want to go play for a franchise that has that much dysfunction? Probably not. No, without question. I mean, <clears throat> you think about it, the one thing you want to do when you draft well, you want to keep your players. And you know, that, that means your scouting department is doing, doing a good job. And if for some reason, things aren't clicking in the locker room, and that's coach's responsibility to manage all that stuff. And obviously, they haven't been doing a good job doing that because they've lost some good players that they have drafted. And you can't continue to, you know, you can't continue to build a program by drafting guys and then losing them, whether it be the free agency whether it's because they want to leave out of here and you trade them, whatever the case may be, or you end up cutting them. But, you know, a valuable guy, I mean, the guy you pick with the fourth pick, and three, after three years, you let him go. That, that, and he's productive. I mean, it's not like he's, he has not been productive. He's, he's productive. That, 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 that doesn't bode well for the coaching staff. So I, I would definitely agree with both of you guys. Man, those, I mean, he's a dead man walking without question. I know he see he has to see the writing on the wall, but you know as far as Trevor Lawrence, yeah, I mean, you know, he maybe he'll do what John Elway did and what uh, <laughs> uh, Eli Manning did and say, hey, I, I'm not, I don't want to go to Jack. Don't don't pick me because I'm not coming. Maybe he'll do that. He probably he could get away with it. Yeah, don't forget Eli Manning forced his hand out as well. Eli Manning. John Elway, all these guys have forced their way out. It's funny how you talk about John Elway, because when I covered Super Bowl 33 uh, after he won his MVP, and that was the first Super Bowl I covered, by, by the way, in Miami, you know, it's funny how you go to the post game uh, the day after press conference, and I was asking Elway the question, and nobody uh, actually mentioned it, so I'm kind of glad it worked out. John, aren't you glad that for somehow, some way, it worked out well that you didn't land with the Baltimore Colts? And you know what? John Elway gave me the most satisfying smile, grin, whatever you want to call it. And you know what? You knew what the answer was, but I think that was one question he was glad I happened to ask. Well, you know what the obvious answer was. But back then, the Baltimore Colts had Robert Ursay. He kept saying, don't draft me, don't draft me. And what do you think ends up happening? He gets shipped out to Denver. It's the best thing that ever happened to his career, without a doubt. So, you know, but yeah, those are good points, Mel. You talk about number one picks that force their way out. And John Elway is the one guy that comes to mind. Eli Manning ends up at that time with the San Diego Chargers. Okay, he owned the jersey for about about two minutes before they made the trade. So he got to take the closest he came to a Chargers uniform was wearing the Chargers hat in front of the commissioner. And you talk about making a move without having to bring on a moving truck. Uh, my goodness, the telephone will work. And he ended up in New York pretty quick, which is where he wanted to go. And we all know a couple Super Bowls later it worked out. We know what happened with, obviously, uh, John Elway won a few Super Bowls and he landed in the Hall of Fame. So unbelievable stuff how it works out. But I don't think that's going to happen with Trevor Lawrence, but it's certainly a good thought to think about it. So, you know, earlier in the week, it looks like Josh Gordon, I think, sold his uh, Super Bowl ring for $138,000. He felt like he didn't deserve it. Well, today it looks like the Seattle Seahawks re-signed Josh Gordon as a wide receiver as he waits reinstatement. Now, here's a little bit of information about Gordon. Okay, he'll receive a one-year contract from the Seahawks and could earn more than $1 million. 
Obviously, uh, we all know about the potential that Gordon has. He led the NFL receiving in 2013 before a suspension derailed his career, and he received his fifth ban in December after violating the league's policies on performance-enhancing drugs and substance abuse. Let that be the worst of his problems. He had other things. But the receiver was waived by the New England Patriots last October, and Seattle claimed him shortly. He played in five games for the Seahawks prior to his suspension, catching seven passes for 139 yards. So when you talk about weapons for Russell West, uh, Russell Wilson, rather, he joins a loaded receiving corp where it includes Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf, Phillip Dorsett, Paul Richardson, and David Moore. I know Pete Carroll has a soft spot for it. Does Josh Gordon deserve yet another chance? You guys decide who wants to take it and the other one go from there. Uh, Mel, you go ahead and start on this one. He's been suspended six times, so that means this is his seventh chance. It tells you the immense talent that this guy obviously possessed at one particular time. Now, when his time in New England before going to Seattle, I didn't really see the burst that he had when he was at Cleveland. Again, I'm happy for the player. Um, I'm hoping that he's got all that other stuff taken care of because again football is only a gonna is only a small portion of your life and, and who he, this man is my more concern my, my biggest concern i'm more concerned about what is he going to do after football when the chances finally dry up what is he going to do yeah i see so the super bowl ring we can you know we can speculate as to why he did that but i'm more concerned about his life after football, because he's going to have a life after football a lot longer than his life with football. And so I'm more concerned about what he's going to do with himself after that. I hope, I really hope he's got some good people around him that, that can give him some good direction. And I'm hoping that uh, he is able to lead a productive life after football. Okay, it's X Man. Well, well, I definitely stand with Mel on everything that he said there. You, you're rooting for the player. You're rooting for him to do the best that he can in this situation, not just on the field, but definitely off the field. He's been suspended six times. It'll be a seventh opportunity. You just hope and pray that he doesn't blow it. You wish him all the best. That potential that you spoke about, Scott, I, I don't believe it's there talent-wise anymore. He still has a lot of talent, but even though 2013 was only seven years ago, that's a lot longer in NFL years. So, no, he, he, he's not what he once was talent-wise. I didn't see the first one he was in New England either. You know, you just wish him all the best, and you just hope that he can get his act together so that he can live a long and productive life after football was over. Okay. Anything else you want to add to it, Mal? No. Okay. Nope. I'm, I'm just again. I'm, I'm happy for the player. I, I hope he makes the best of it. I know that as a competitor, and you know this as well as anybody, you take away his livelihood, then you know obviously it, it could be a problematic. I know one guy who benefited by the nine million chances was Adam Pacman Jones, and he managed to salvage a decent career with a lot of suspensions, and he was able to do it with the Cincinnati Bengals. So we'll move on to something that kind of relates to what we're talking about. In the future, but here's one that I want you guys to think about for a moment before you answer, okay? And that's this, because when it caught my attention, it made me pause and think for a moment. All right, ready? Okay. A fan nominates Colin, uh, Quar- Colin Kaepernick for the Hall of Fame. Now, this is really interesting, okay? Because a Vermont man nominated San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick, or at least former 49ers, for the Pro Football Hall of Fame for his efforts to raise awareness for racial inequality and police brutality. I'm going to go ahead, and I want you to think about this for a minute while I give you all the information and my sources, okay? After discovering that anyone can make a nomination, Bob Burkett sent a letter to the Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, asking that Kaepernick is inducted under the contributor category. Let me repeat this again. The contributor category according to Nancy Armour of USA Today. Now, I'm going to continue on with this, okay? It's my pleasure, privilege, and responsibility as a supporter of racial equality to nominate Mr. Colin Kaepernick, Burkett wrote in his letter. Mr. Kaepernick has shown exceptional courage 
in highlighting the damaging effects of racial injustice for black people and on our society as a whole. His respectful kneeling posture has created a powerful symbol for those who are opposed, oppressed, excuse me, by our society. The contributor category is for individuals who have made outstanding career contributions to the pro football in capacities other than playing or coaching. It was added to the Hall of Fame in 2014. He's gotten a raw deal so far, Burkett said of Kaepernick. It's a little bit like Muhammad Ali refusing to serve in Vietnam. The initial reaction was, holy cow, what a horrible thing. Then a little while later, it's like, man, that guy had some guts. You think what I can do? I can't force an owner to hire the guy, but darn it, I can put him in the Hall of Fame. The earliest Kaepernick's nomination could be considered as 2022. This is loaded. Okay, Xavier McKnight, I want you to lead off with this because I know we've done a lot of shows in this area. Mel, you take it from there, and I have some powerful opinions about this as well. Go ahead, X-Man. Well, I appreciate this, and I am actually in agreement with it as far as the contributing category goes, but I'm not having my hopes up as far as it actually happening. He can't even get a job in the league right now just because so many of these owners, they're afraid of the backlash that's going to come from this, from the fan bases, if they do it. So I don't see the NFL doing this, but I appreciate what, what what's attempting to be done here. And I am in agreement with it because Colin Kaepernick has brought a lot of attention to racial inequality and police brutality in America. And he paid the ultimate price for it by not having his livelihood anymore. They have basically essentially taken his livelihood away from him. And when those rumors were floating around earlier this year that Colin Kaepernick may finally get back in the NFL. I wasn't holding my breath too long on that either. So, you know, it's, it's very nice. I agree with it for the contributors category, but I don't see it happening. Not at all. Go ahead, Mel. Yeah, I don't see that's happening either. I appreciate the sentiment, the thought, the time that someone took to put this together, but I don't see it as a viable viable option. I don't see it as something that's going to happen. <clears throat> it's great for us to be able to talk about it, but um, you know, it gives us a topic to talk about and, and, and go back and forth on it and express our opinions, but I don't think that this is something that's going to be taken seriously by the folks at the NFL who, who vote on these types of things. Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of things that Cap can still continue to do and maybe one day he could uh, get, get in as a, as a contributor. But I think right now, you know, I, I understand the, the sentiment surrounding it. I just don't think that it's, it's something that the NFL would look, would, would look to do. Well, all I'll say is winning a collusion lawsuit certainly didn't help his case, and that's why he got blackballed. And I think that, you know, as t- yeah, remember one thing, though, guys, we're in 2020. So you still have two years to go. So you don't know whether this thing could pick up some steam later on. I think it would be great if it does happen as well. I think we have a unanimous, uh, here amongst the three of us. But remember, we got two years to go here. If this Black Lives Matter con- movement continues, as well as the other things, this might have more, pick up more steam. You never know. Roger Goodell might endorse it. And if he gives it an endorsement, you never know what could happen. So I would never say never. I don't know if it's publicity. Yeah, I think it's beyond comprehension that he's ever going to get another job right now. But, you know, the contributors category, remember, was only developed just six years ago. And when you put the sum of the whole uh, and the sum of the whole of the parts, you get to drill. Okay, I think it's not so unrealistic. Again, this is a category that was only developed six years ago. In other Hall of Fames, you have builders categories, and I think including this one as well. This is a, this one's relatively new, but as this movement continues to go on, I'm not so sure how far fetched it isn't. You know, it'll be pretty interesting. To know, but uh, I don't know. I'm not ruling this one out for some crazy reason. The way the climate is these days, again, we'll know in about two years from now when this comes up in 2020 if it gets any steam. Now, if you guys have been around any of the Hall of Fame voting per se when you get players in, you know, I don't know whether the writers factor into this whole thing or whatever the case may be, 
But let me tell you, when something get picks up steam with these Hall of Fame things, once they take off, they can take off like a rocket. Again, I know it's a nomination right now, but I think this is a story that could develop, and the best part about it is we got about two years to talk about it. Okay? So, good stuff. So, with that said, now uh, all NFL team facilities will be closed on November 3rd, and they'll be used as voting stations. All right, Mel Farr, you can go ahead and take th- this one. Xavier, and then I'll go ahead with it as well. You said NFL facilities are going to be used as voting yeah, stations? Yeah, NFL team facilities are to be uh, closed for November 3rd and used as voting stations. Uh, I mean, I think that's great uh, for the people that want to go out there and, and stand in line. I'm going to vote absentee and, okay. and avoid, those, uh, avoid the lines. But, I mean, obviously, you know, voter suppression has been something that we've had to deal with in the African-American community for a long time. Why not make it easier for people who do want to go out there and exercise this right that many people have fought and died for? Uh, why not make it easier for them to go out there and do that? I think it just makes all the sense in the world <clears throat> to, to do that. And I'm glad to see that the, that the NFL is doing this. I know the NBA talked about doing it as well, opening up their, opening up their arenas. <laughs> I don't know where, you know, most, you know, some, a lot of these arenas aren't necessarily in the urban community. I know the, I know here in Atlanta, it is in the urban community. It's right there downtown, both the stadium and the arena, both downtown. That makes it very convenient for uh, the urban dweller to get to uh, the polling station and be able to cast their votes. Uh, and, you know, it, it's good to see that I think that, you know, with the George Floyd incident that, you know, eyes are being opened. And ears are finally listening to the plight of the black man in this country. You know, it's not easy to be black. It, it never, it never has been, and it's still not easy. So I'm glad to see that they're trying to make it easier for for African Americans to be able to cast their vote. Now, Mel, I know you've talked about in the past on other broadcasts that obviously our issues are due to uh, n- not very good leadership. Is that correct? Right, that's where a lot of the uh, roots of the problems are. Well, a lot gonna... of the, a lot of the, the, the divisiveness that you see right now in this country is, uh, you know, our, our leadership is is fanning the flames, pouring right. gasoline on it. You know, right now is, you know, when we're dealing with the things that we're dealing with in our country, right now we need somebody to bring everybody together, not further divide us. Um, bring us together. So yeah, it's without question that I think that there's a problem with leadership right now in the in the direction that that they're taking us in. You know, I don't you know choose to get political on this show. I mean, everybody needs to you know vote their conscience. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely feel there's a problem with leadership as far as how the coronavirus is being held, uh, been, being dealt with, and how we're dealing with these these killings of unarmed black men and women right now that are going on in this country. Just some of the comments that have been made. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. To, you don't even have to read between the lines of what he's saying. He's saying it point blank. He's saying it. He's, right. he's catering to his base. That's all he's concerned about. He so he showed no compassion whatsoever for the the victims of these of the these atrocities that have been committed by the different police forces throughout our country. Now. What if I told you guys, but I'm not going to dole it the right name right now uh, until I get this thing finalized, but I'm talking about a future guest that will probably be on the broadcast the next couple of weeks. And I rarely ever allow politics, but when I spoke to this individual today, yeah, I may probably make an exception to that rule where there will be sports and politics on this particular broadcast. But I'm only going to say it this way, but I don't want to turn it into a long thing, that President Donald Trump is unhandleable, Okay. And I'm not going to go any further than that, but that's, and I rarely ever cross that line between sports and politics. But when this guy was speaking to me, I'm definitely tempted and I'm prepared to proceed with the broadcast because as Xavier McKnight will tell you, I have not been afraid or shy to talk about important matters. And my instincts are telling me that as long as this guy and I can get it worked out, he'll be on. But I'm only introducing for the current audience right now, that this individual says that Donald Trump is unhandleable. Is that word unhandleable appropriate? Mel, you lead off and then Xavier, take it from there. You know, I, I can say I'm disappointed in in our president in the way that he's handled things. Uh, I mean, I knew, I understood who he was when he was voted in. I understood that and I was, I was okay with that. 
And uh, but I'm really disappointed. I mean, I've had that. I, you know, the, the, the crazy thing is, I've had an opportunity to spend some time with him prior to him being the president. When back way back a long time ago, when we we're trying to get, when Detroit was trying to get the casinos in, in we we're trying to get casino licenses in the city of Detroit. Uh, <clears throat> Donald Trump approached my dad, hmm. and they were going to be partners in a casino in the city of Detroit. Ultimately, Dennis Archer didn't choose my dad and Donald Trump's group and went with some, went, went with three other people. Right. But I had an opportunity to spend some time with him. Went out to a fight and sat with him ringside at a fight. He makes you feel like you're the most important person in the room. I mean, the guy's, I mean, he, he's a charmer. I'm not, don't get me oh, wrong. Man. I mean, he, he, he is a charmer. He makes you feel like you're the most important person in the room. I mean, uh, you know, he, he knows everything about you and, and your family. I mean, he's come to, he's come to Michigan. And, and come to the dealership. I mean, so we had many opportunities to interact with him and, and really have been disappointed by, 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 you know, what he has done lately and what he has decided to do and how he's decided to run his campaign and how he's decided to become, you know, to, 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 to run this country. Extremely, extremely disappointed. Again, I don't want to get too much in the, you know, in, in the politics on there because, you know, if you want to lose a friend, start talking politics. Right. No, I hear that, you. That, 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 you know, so I try to stay away from with my friends as much as possible. Well, I don't either. But the bottom line is, is uh, I won't do it. And ironically, I met Donald Trump at the 1984 USFL Championship game in Tampa. And you want to talk about a charmer? He invited myself and a few other writers up to his hotel, and we talked about. Uh, you know, the league, and how did that turn out? Well, the USFL went busted because he wanted to compete with the NFL, and the NFL didn't want no part of him later on. But again, I understand about losing a friend. If there's certain subjects that you go ahead and bring on, but you make sure that you are aware of the material you go on there, then you're able to avoid those kinds of uh, conflicts. So you're, you're right, though. He is a charmer. He was really nice to me and a bunch of other ones. But I'll bet if you ask Donald Trump, Okay, uh, his uh, uh, what happened with the USFL? He won't be so nice any more than George Steinbrenner was ever nice. Okay, about talking about New York Yankee managerial hiring. So, the only thing I'm a little surprised with Donald Trump was that Herschel Walker and you guys are Georgia guys is never on his cabinet. Another day for another time. But just thought I would throw that. All right, X Man, take it from there about the NFL uh, facilities and voting and, and pick up on what we just spoke about. Well, I love what the NFL and the NBA are doing. Uh, LeBron James really has uh, helped take the lead on this thing with this more than a vote campaign that he started. Uh, kudos to him. Kudos to both of these leagues for doing this. And all we can do at this point is go out and do our part and vote and encourage others to do their part and use their civic duty and go out and vote. I'm not telling you who to vote for. That's not my place to do that. But go out and use your voice Use your own personal platform. Use your civic duty and go out and vote. But as far as you guys uh, meeting Donald Trump and referring to him as a charmer, that, those are your experiences. I wouldn't know that. I've never met Donald Trump. I've never met a member of Donald Trump's family. I haven't met anybody ever associated with Donald Trump in a close capacity in my life. So I can't speak on that. I can, but from what I see people say about him on social media, who do interact with him, who do have personal relationships with him, who do have a great rapport with him, they say the same exact thing. They say he's a charmer and he makes them feel like they are the most important person in the room. So uh, this is what I see everybody else saying. So I have no doubt to sit here and believe that those are not true things according to what those people are saying. But can I say it for myself? No, because I haven't experienced it yet. And I'll be honest with you, I don't necessarily care to experience it either. And I'll just leave it at that. That's fine. Well, the bottom line is I'm glad that the NFL <laughs> team facilities are going to be used. It. What's that? No, I said I don't, I don't blame it, Xavier. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, I'm just glad the NFL is opening up their team facilities, as is the uh, NBA. And, again, everybody's talking about how important the vote is. Well, the more people that open up these facilities are dealing with COVID-19, then the more people you get out there, nobody's satisfied with 60% of a vote when this is arguably the most important election in our time, that's for sure. So, I mean, I haven't voted in a long time. I won't get into the logistics about it. But this time, for some reason, with the state of the country being where it's at, I feel a responsibility in this particular point to do it, and I'm doing exactly that. So we're, we're, our final topic of the night 
is uh, the place where the president happens to reside at the moment, and that's Washington, D.C. But this time, we're going to talk about the Washington uh, football team. I know what I wanted to say, but I won't. And Dwayne Haskins, it looks like, will start at QB over Alex Smith. Now, I'm going to say this. For Alex Smith to be on the roster after 28 surgeries, to me, is a miracle in its own right to be the backup. Some reason or another, I like this move, and I'm just glad that Alex Smith is going to play again because the last thing you want to do is end your career the way he did, which is parallel to Joe Theismann. All right, Xavier, go ahead. Well, I'm very happy for Alex Smith as well. It's a miracle and a blessing that he's even in the position that he's in right now to be physically clear, to walk normally, be able to actually be on an NFL roster, and to actually have a chance to still go out and take snaps again. That is the only words that come to my mind when it comes to that are miracle and blessing. Those are the words that come to my mind when it comes to that. But I believe in Dwayne Haskins. I, I believe he still has a very bright future in the NFL. And I believe with him having some stability at coaching now with Ron Rivera, who we wish all the best as he continues to battle cancer, with him having some stability there now with coaching and with this organization now seeming like it's taking a step in the right direction, I believe they very well could have have their franchise quarterback in Dwayne Haskins. And to have Alex Smith there now with him on the field during the game, in his ear, even more than he probably already was, it's only going to help him more than it's going to hurt him. Go ahead, Mel. Uh, I, um, you know, it doesn't surprise me that, that, that he's going to be the quarterback. I mean, they spent a lot of draft capital on 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 – on Dwayne Haskins. I know they also brought over, um, didn't they bring over the guy from uh, Tampa Bay too? I mean, excuse me, not Tampa Bay, but from Carolina, didn't they bring a quarterback from over there as well? Yeah. Yes, they did. They brought in Kyle Allen. Yeah, thank you, Xavier. Yep. Okay. But I am I am surprised, though. I mean, I don't know if you guys have watched the, uh, I, don't, I can't remember what it was, the, 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 the documentary on Alex Smith. And even looking at him, and I haven't really seen I haven't really seen video of him out there on the field, uh, but I just saw him walking around just when he got the clearance to to be able to go to practice. And when he ran out the house, he was still a little gimpy on that leg. And, you know, this guy not only almost lost a limb, he almost lost his life. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So just to get back to – where he is right you know, forget about football if he never played football again i'd be fine with it just to be able to have a a normal life it's really you know all the expectations you can have for alex smith i don't see him getting back on the football field because i don't know if he can protect himself because one of the one of his greatest assets was his mobility is you know he he was a, a mobile quarterback uh, and alex smith doesn't have anything to prove to anybody i mean alex smith has had a, a has had a great career you know, from San Francisco to Kansas City to, to Washington, right. he's had a great career. He has nothing to prove to anybody, unless he's just trying to prove something to himself. He has nothing to prove to me by going out there. I don't know how mentally, you know, physically he may be okay. And, and, and let's say he, let's say he's 85%, 80, 85% physically healed. Where is he at mentally? Right. That's what you have to be concerned about with him and really protect himself from himself. Uh, in, in, as far as that's concerned, because um, you know it's going to take him a lot longer to mentally heal than it will to physically heal. I know it's been a while since he's been out on the football field, but honestly, you know, in my opinion, I don't see them putting him back out there. I really, truly don't. I know he's been cleared to play, to practice, and all that. Like I said, the, and I've only seen a few clips. The clips that I have seen have not been encouraging as far as somebody that's going to be able to go out there and protect himself. And that's what I'm talking about, protect himself, to be able to get out of the way if he needs to get out of the way. Uh, I'm just happy that, he, that, he, that he's able to walk again. I'm happy that, he's, if, that he has the limb, you know, that he's able to keep the limb. Um, I'm happy about that. I'm happy that, about that for him and that he'll be able to have a somewhat quote-unquote Normal, life, normal remainder of his life, um, because you know, there's obviously going through the trauma that he went through. That leg is not normal. I mean, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know if you guys have seen the little documentary that they had, but the stuff that he's had to go through has just been un unbelievable, unbelievable. 
Yeah, I think it's been very inspiring myself. The fact that he's even in this situation just blows me away to begin with. And like Xavier pointed out, Kyle Allen, to me, to me, it's good that they happen to have him there for sure. So with that particular uh, point, I don't know if we still have Xavier. Are you still there, Xavier? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I think Xavier was right. The uh, Kyle Allen thing, the fact that he's such an inspiring guy. And let's face it, if he doesn't play football, at least the guy could be a coach. So, you know, there's still a lot of football acumen in there. The question is, is he going to be uh, coaching or uh, coach on the field? That remains to be seen, but he's been a heck of a story, and I can't really say a whole lot more than that. So with that said, okay, uh, as far as we're concerned, we're going to wrap up the broadcast in a moment. So, you know what, Mel, why don't you let everybody know how they can get a hold of you? Uh, all the social media at Mel Farr Jr., LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and that's at Mel Farr Jr. My email is Mel Farr Jr., that's M-E-L-F-A-R-R-J-R at gmail.com. And you can check out what we're doing as far as with our scholarship programs for the youth in Detroit and here in Atlanta at melfar.org. Okay, Xavier, take it away from there. Let them know how they get a hold of you. And then I'll mention my thing. And then Xavier McKnight does such a good job of signing off. He gets to do it again. All right, go ahead, Xavier. All right, you can uh, find me on Twitter by following me at XTMCKNIGHII, the two I's at the end of capitalized. You can follow me on Instagram at XMCKNIGH22. You can send me a follow request and a friend request on LinkedIn and Facebook just by typing in Xavier McKnight. And don't forget, you can listen to us tomorrow night on The Real and the Rare here on the WFAN Network. All right, as far as we're concerned... You know, if you want to listen to this broadcast, you can um, find it wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find it on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts. I'll repeat myself again. Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Google Podcasts. In terms of following us, you can do so at Tribune South on Twitter, Facebook, South Florida Tribune, Instagram, South Florida Tribune. Xavier McKnight knows this one all too well, right? have a YouTube channel, uh, South Florida Tribune. We'll be doing our broadcast, which I'll get to in a moment, via that. So you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, South Florida Tribune, and you'll be able to get uh, some broadcasts out of that. Website, www.southfloridatribune.com. We have uh, regular media distribution partners. We have our columnists, and these broadcasts are there as well. Uh, my LinkedIn information is Scott Morgan Roth. That's M-O-R-G-A-N-R-O-T-H. You can connect with me there. I'd be more than happy to reach out to you as well. Now, a little preview about what's ahead for us tonight on 108 Stitches Baseball Talk. I'll have Rick Curdy and Stuart Hack talking about the life of Tom Seaver. And Xavier McKnight and I will be talking NBA tomorrow on The Real and the Rare, right? Xavier, give a preview. That is correct. That is correct. So, you know, we have a lot to talk about NBA. The playoffs are going on. We have some coaching movement as well. And, again, I really enjoy the YouTube channel because what's good about it is not only uh, we, our voices are heard, but you get to do the visual as well. So, all right, Xavier, uh, how are we going to sign off this? What are we going to tell our fans out there? Oh, well, i got a few things that I need to go ahead and say right now. First of all, we send our best to uh, everybody in Texas and Louisiana, in particular the Lake Charles area, who are recovering and cleaning up their homes and their communities after the aftermath of the impact that Hurricane Laura left in that place last week. It's just been some absolutely devastating videos and images that we have seen, and we wish those people all the best and in any way that we can possibly help them out. We will definitely do our part to continue to do so. Giving our best to all of the people in Belize right now. Hurricane Nana is there right now and is going through that area right now. So we're giving our best, our thoughts, our prayers, our best wishes to those people in that area. It's been a very tough week with the uh, losses of many people that we've all suffered through. With the most impactful one coming and more shocking one, I should say, coming with a uh, Chadwick Bozeman on Friday night. We learned about Tom Seaver on Wednesday. Uh, Georgetown legendary men's basketball head coach John Thompson. Uh, rest in peace to all of those. I mean, Arizona men's basketball head coach Luke Olson won a national championship there in 1997. Uh, John Thompson winning a national championship at Georgetown in 1984, coaching them two national championships 
two other additional national championships in 1982, 1985. You can make an argument. He should have won those national championships, too. That's an argument for another day. But we just want to send our best, our thoughts, our prayers, our condolences to all of those families. And I just simply want to say this to everyone out there. Love on your people while they're here. Give people their flowers while they're here. Let people know that you love them. There's nothing wrong with opening up your mouth and telling people those three words, I love you. Nothing wrong with saying those words. And as you guys know, we have to end it on this note here. COVID-19 is still a very real thing out there, ladies and gentlemen. And you need to continue to be vigilant and take this thing serious and be responsible. Wear your mask. Put on your gloves. Don't gather in large crowds. Continue to practice social distancing. Let's do everything we can to take care of ourselves, but to also take care of each other. That's the only way we're going to continue to push through this. Well, That's I should, all I got to say on uh, all of that. Well, I should point out one other thing in my office. I happen to have an old T-shirt from the Collegiate Championship in 1982, March 27th to 29th at the Superdome. And I was actually at that North Carolina Georgetown game, and it was an incredible Final Four for sure. That Final Four, you had Louisville Cardinals, you had the Houston Cougars, the North Carolina Tar Heels, the Georgetown Hoyas. That was the first year that CBS actually covered the Final Four. I actually, at a later date, interviewed Gary Bender uh, when he was the announcer for the Phoenix Suns. So I was there when Thompson had the near miss, the way he handled the Fred Brown situation with nothing less than classy. So, yeah, that's unbelievable. We lost a lot of people. Lou Henson was another guy that recently passed. And we all know that this year, 2020, has been a year that to me is unbelievable. I've lost some people in my hometown, like Al Kaline. And, of course, for all you NBA fans out there, we really let it off with the loss of David Stern. But with that said, 108 Stitches Baseball Talk follows this broadcast. All I can tell you on behalf of Xavier McKnight, Melfar Jr., my name is Scott Morgan, we the Motor City Manmouth. Hoping you can join us. There will be a sports exchange on Monday night. Okay, George Icorn and myself and Damon Knight will be back on. So all I can tell you is, folks, have yourself a great Labor Day weekend. And we will see you next week from Melfar Jr., Xavier Knight, myself, Scott Morgan, Roth, the Motor City Madmouth. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Good night.